Hello everyone, welcome to lecture 34 of the online course on nanophotonics, plus bionics and metamaterials. Today's lecture will be on nanofabrication. So, in this lecture we will see the most mostly used uh, nanofabrication methods and we will discuss about thin films and different ways of making thin films like physical methods, chemical methods and epitaxy and then we will conclude this lecture. So, this particular module will give you a brief overview of how different fabrication methods can help you realize the structures that we have studied in this particular course. So, it will not be a very extensive overview or in detail study of the different uh, uh, fabrication methods. I will try to catch and touch upon different topics uh, so that um, you have basic idea of how to realize the structures that we have discussed. So, when we talk about nanofabrication, nanofabrication lacks a clear definition and it is not very distinctly separated from the term microfabrication. So, new methods are constantly developed to make electronic components smaller starting from uh, micrometers to nanometers and the same techniques can also be used for nanophotonics, plasmonics and uh, metamaterials. So, microfabrication that those are typically done for larger parts will become nanofabrication when the parts shrink and the dimensions become you know almost comparable to nanometers. Okay. So, the basics remain similar. Now, integrated circuit production drives this particular technology and they provide extra advantages in the areas like photonics. Tools and techniques keep evolving with time. There is a constant research and updation going on to make the process more robust so that there are less fabrication error and uh, the yield increases and there are also challenges coming from continuous shrinking of the component sizes. So, the process has resulted in smaller and smaller electronic parts with widespread benefits. That is why you see all these uh, devices they are becoming very lightweight and small compact these days. So, that is because of the advancement in nanotechnology that allows the uh, you know scientists and engineers to fabricate structures which are really really small. Now, if you look into nanofabrication there are mainly three parts thin films, lithography and etching. So, thin films as you can see there will be a substrate and you can develop a thin film on top of that. This film thickness can be typically few to several nanometers okay, or even micrometers. Okay, those are thin films. Then you have lithography. Lithography is basically uh, a process of making patterns. Okay, so, you can see it starts with a silicon substrate which is coated with a photo or e-beam resist. We will come into the details of this in the next lecture, but let us quickly go through what it looks like. Then um, you will basically have a hard or soft mask which actually got the pattern that you want to develop and then when you expose UV or electron beam, okay, your, your photo resist Okay, if they are positive uh, photoresist, they get developed okay, and then they can be etched away by some kind of solvent and this is the pattern of the resist that remains. Okay. So, after that you can evaporate material and that material fills in this particular gap and then when you remove this uh, photoresist completely, these are the patterns which are basically developed on the silicon. So, you can this is done by putting this in a lift off solvent. So, all these are uh, the standard processes in nanofabrication uh, technology. So, we will look into this in the next lecture. Today, we will be mainly covering uh, thin films and in the last lecture of this module, we will be covering uh, etching. Okay. So, here you can see that you have got a circuit material that needs to be etched and you develop a photoresist first on that okay, and then 
you can expose these areas of the circuit material to the agent they can etch away those uh, circuit material and this is what you get after etching so these are the three methods that actually help you develop those structures that you have seen in this particular course okay so these as you can see these methods are very much standardized and optimized for semiconductor industry and that is where people are actually aiming towards making uh, photonics material CMOS compatible so that the same foundry with some minor modification can help us fabricate those uh, nanophotonic structures or plasmonic structures if we are going for totally different materials that might be difficult for mass production at this current stage when the foundry is not supporting those kind of material fabrication. So if you look into the thin film um, industry, thin film size uh, science is basically a broad field which is used in uh, various industries. Okay, And uh, thin films are ultra thin layers that can be found in products such as eyeglasses, okay, uh, screens and vehicles and these serve different kind of purposes something like reducing reflection, preventing damage and altering properties. In tiny computer parts, these uh, thin films can control electricity and help you switch. Okay? So, Another important application you can think of is the gate directory in transistors which is often less than 10 nanometer thick. So, those are also thin films. So, here you can see applications of thin film in different different uh, disciplines. So, if you think of optics, it can give you anti reflection coating, highly reflected coating something like laser mirrors, you can have interference filters, beam splitter, then thin film polarizers, integrated optics and so on. If you think of optoelectronics, you can use them for photo detectors, image transmission, optical memories, LCD, TFTs and all this. If you think of electronics, they can be like passive thin film elements like resistors, condensers and interconnects. You can think of active thin film elements like transistors and diodes okay? and um, integrated circuits like VLSI circuits, they also use a lot of thin films then CCD charge coupled device you can think of uh, chemistry where catalysis electrocatalysis um, biocatalysis photocatalysis all those things are the application you can think of uh, sensors you can think of magnetic applications engineering and processing and also new materials. I will not read out all of them, but you can always see that there are a lot of applications of thin films. They are also very useful in biomedicine where you can have uh, neurological sensors, you can have claddings for a depot pharmacy and biocompatible implant coatings. So, all these things are possible. So, there are vast application of thin film technology not only in the area of uh, semiconductor or photonics, they can actually have applications in lot more uh, other disciplines. Okay? They can be used for um, alternative energy or green energy, something like in solar collectors or solar cells and so on. Okay? So, as I mentioned earlier, these thin films can be really, really thin and uh, they can be from uh, 10 to 1000 uh, nanometers. So, typically 10 nanometer to 1 micron that is what we call them as thin films. Okay? And um, these are for visible and infrared light. And uh, for extreme UV light, the films will become even more thinner because uh, extreme UV light has got a very short wavelength and in that case you can actually use thin films of 1 to 2 nanometer thickness and these are typically used in photo masks will come into this. So, right now just keep this uh, new terms in mind we will discuss about these new terms soon in this lecture or in the subsequent lectures. Now, thin film pr uh, properties change based on how they are made. So, the key properties include how well they coat the surfaces, their density and their electrical behavior. And density affects how light bands in the film and stress can wrap or crack it. 
So, this is the effect of density. When the thin films are made from compounds, the films make up can vary depending on how it is created and for single element thin films, it is not usually of a worry. And when you develop thin films, the impurities, grain size and how tightly the elements of the particles are packed, they also affect how well the thin film will conduct electricity. So, their conductivity depends on all these parameters. Now, how do you make thin films? So, the process of making thin films can be broadly classified into two categories, physical methods and chemical methods. Physical methods involve transferring the material from the source to the substrate without changing its chemical state. So, it is a physical method. Where on the other hand, when you think of chemical method, it, the film is basically created as a byproduct of some chemical reaction. So, let us look into the physical methods first. So, when you talk about physical methods, there are two widely used methods for adding thin films. One is evaporation, another is sputtering. So, these methods work like a special kind of painting with the vaporized material adding tiny particles to a particular substrate. That will be the surface that you will be coating with the thin material. Evaporation and sputtering are part of a group called physical vapor deposition or PVD. In PVD, the materials are transformed into vapor and then layered onto a surface one atom at a time. And these processes are often carried out in high vacuum chambers that prevent interference from gases in the surrounding. So, if we look into the evaporation method, evaporation method involves heating the source material a lot until it turns into vapor. And vapor pressure plays a very important role here because all materials evaporate at specific temperatures as you can see here. So, this is basically the uh, pressure it is given in millibar, this one is in tor and this is the temperature scale. Okay? So, that is in centigrade and that is in Kelvin. Okay? So, and here are the materials like tungsten, gold, magnesium, there are many more all listed here. Okay? So, this is basically a vapor pressure versus uh, temperature curve for different kind of metals. So, commonly used materials barely evaporate at room temperature. right? So, you can see that uh, gold with a very low vapor pressure below 10 to the minus 15 uh, tor at room temperature. Okay? Now, when you see how the vapor pressure for gold is changing okay, with temperature, mm, so you can see that at 1500 degree centigrade, it actually changes to uh, 100 millitor. And the vapor pressure also depends on the position in the vapor stream. So, the pressure decreases as the vapor moves away from the source. Make sense? So, the, clo over the closest it is to the source, it will be the highest uh, vapor pressure. So, vapor pressure on the surface where the film forms can be estimated from the vapor flow patterns. And to calculate the film growth rate, pressure connects to the rate of atoms hitting the surface. So, that way you can calculate the rate at which your thin film will be growing. Often, instead of directly measuring the temperature and vapor pressure, deposition rate is controlled by adjusting the power to the source. So, that is also another method to uh, you know adjust how much the temperature, how much thickness will be deposited. So, among the two methods of evaporation, you can see here one method is called resistively heating evaporation process. So, in this particular uh, process, there are two methods. So, this is the one, the other one will show in the next slide. So, in this one, um, the pallet of the source material that is here, it is actually put in a metal container like a boat okay, and it is heated using a strong electric current around 100 uh, amperes. 
So, this is particularly called resistively heated uh, evaporation. So, it is very simple um, needing only a low voltage uh, DC source, but it has got some drawbacks. Drawbacks something like it is inefficient and there are chances of potential contamination due to other parts also getting heated up and evaporating along with the source. So, this boat material or other parts also may get heated up and they, they will also vaporize along with the source material. So, this is how it works the source material or evaporation material is here, the filament or the heater element is here. So, it hits this one up the vaporized material particles they actually go and settle down on the substrate which is kept right on top of it and this is done in a vacuum chamber. The second method is called a electron beam heating okay, where the heated electrons are basically accelerated by high voltage. So, here you see the amount of voltage requirement goes very very high it is around 10 kilo volt and then it is focused this particular electron beam is focused onto the source pallet. So, this happens again inside a vacuum. So, the electrons can be controlled by magnetic field okay, and without heating the gas molecules. This particular method of electron beam uh, evaporation is pretty um, efficient and here accurately heating of the source can be obtained so that it minimizes the contamination and therefore, it is a good process of developing you know high quality thin films, but only problem is that it requires a complex high voltage power source. And safety also becomes important here because you are dealing with very high voltage. Now, despite this electron beam evaporation is widely used in thin film research and development the reason you get a very high quality film. Now, the next method of developing thin film is called sputtering. So, sputtering also uses a vacuum system with an excited gas plasma. Okay. So, this is the typical uh, setup for sputtering. So, here you can see that there is a gas inlet this is the outlet and uh, the sputtering gas comes in and it hits the cathode sputtering target. Okay. So, that knocks out the uh, metallic particles or atoms and they actually go and settle down on the substrate forming a thin film. Okay. So, here you can see how it works. So, plasma ions. So, these are the plasma ions which are. Uh, so, this is plasma and then the sputtering gas enters and the plasma ions are basically directed at the cathode and they could knock the neutral atoms of the surfaces. You can see here M is the metal that has been knocked off okay? and these atoms they collect um, on all surfaces including the substrate. So, you can see a thin film being growing on this it is because of this. Okay? Now, in this particular method unlike evaporation it does not depend on heating. Okay? So, what is the method of uh, atoms coming out? They, the atoms are basically ejected by momentum. So, this leads into much denser films. Okay? However, there are some benefits with sputtering because it is more uh, flexible and that is why it is popular in the industry compared to evaporation. Heating is not required, high voltage requirement is not there. So, it is pretty good targets and plasma sources in sputtering can be made of different shapes um, for various coating um, setups something like circles, rectangles or any other unusual shape you can coat. Okay. Sputtering can happen upward, downward or sideways while you know evaporation happens only upward. Okay. So, these are the flexibilities with the sputtering technique. Moreover, the plasma power in the sputtering comes from a DC or RF source. Okay? So, for metal targets uh, DC sputtering works whereas, for insulating targets RF sputtering is used where the target acts as the capacitor for the plasma. We will not go into too much of detail, but 
it is good to know what are the different techniques being used for developing what kind of films. So, RF excitation um, needs a matching network due to variable impedance and uh, it is used for both conductive and non-conductive targets. Okay? In sputtering, the atoms collide before reaching the substrate due to plasma gas making it less directional than evaporation. So, these are a couple of you know pros and cons of uh, sputtering as compared to evaporation. There is a variation to it which is called reactive sputtering and uh, in reactive sputtering what happens um, a bit of reactive gas like uh, oxygen or nitrogen misses, mixes with the argon gas to create compounds from uh, ejected target uh, molecule. Okay? So, the setup looks like this you have got a power supply here this is the target which is capped this is the plasma formation you have got argon gas and also you get some reactive gas and this is the vacuum chamber okay and from the target these are knocked off and then uh, the materials or nanoparticles which are ejected from this target gets uh, reacted with this react uh, reacting gas and then the compound gets deposited on the substrate. So, during this process as you can see the atoms are ejected from the target by uh, energized ions to form a plasma that is directed to the substrate under a high vacuum. Argon is commonly used as the sputtering gas and the sputtering is carried out with uh, DC uh, power source and uh, RF alternating current or ion assisted deposition. There are three methods. So, mainly DC and RF uh, sputtering are used and in this particular case of reactive uh, sputtering a reactive gas such as oxygen are used for getting oxides. You can use nitrogen if you want to create uh, thin films of nitrides. Okay? They are also passed to the reaction chamber along with the argon gas that you can see here and this uh, reactive gases react with the target atoms in the plasma to form the desired composition and then they get deposited in the film as I ex explained before. So, while forming perovskite oxide films multiple targets with different elements are uh, simultaneously sputtered which are reacted with oxygen and uh, uh, they deposit as the desired film. Since the target elements and oxygen exhibit a large electronegativity difference the formed ions can be negatively charged and they can be accelerated towards the substrate due to the difference in the potential of the negatively charged target and the grounded substrate. Okay? So, the substrate is grounded. Okay? These ionic fluxes possibly act as sputtering ions to re-sputter the growing thin films onto the substrate or modify the composition of the films or etching the substrate. Okay. So, the next method to develop um, thin film is uh, pulsed laser deposition. So, here the name itself tells you that you are going to use a laser pulse okay, for depositing uh, thin films. So, how it works? So, pulsed laser deposition or PLD employs brief powerful laser pulses which are as short as few nanoseconds to remove the target material. So, you can see in the diagram here you have got a laser pulse you focus it and you hit the target okay? and then there is a plasma plum that goes towards the substrate and it gets deposited. So, the la laser energy here is focused on the target surface causing rapid material evaporation and atom injection. So, that gives you this plasma plume okay, and the atoms then they gather on the surface to give you that thin film. So, what is the key advantage of this PLD? It can be performed in ultra high vacuum or with various pressures and gases due to the laser source being external to the uh, vacuum chamber. So, that, that is the flexibility it provides and the main advantage of PLD is its ability to remove target materials in 
stark immunity manner that treating all atoms equally due to high laser fluence and rapid ablation. So, that way you are able to deposit uniform films using pulsed laser deposition. So, PLD is uh, particularly suited for complex ceramic films like uh, yttrium barium copper oxide YBCO, lead zircon zirconate titanate PZT and different other uh, carbides, oxides, nitrides okay, that are challenging to deposit using other methods. So, you can actually deposit this kind of films using PLD method. So, as I told you that uh, the main advantage of PLD is that it is non-discriminatory and uh, it gives you stoichiometric removal of target atoms okay, and it facilitates and it comes from rapid ablation and high laser fluence. So, quickly this evaporation takes place and it takes place from all from the entire uh, target. So, that happens very very quickly. So, with that we more or less cover all the basic uh, methods in this particular physical methods of depositing uh, thin films. Now, let us look into the chemical methods of depositing thin films. Now, as we mentioned before that chemical methods will deposit the thin films as a byproduct of some chemical uh, reaction. So, chemical methods they offer uniform well covered and stoichiometric films, but different gases and chambers are often required for each type of film. So, that makes it very very specific. So, so and it is that makes it also costly if you are experimenting in uh, different films because and using different gases. So, you need different different chambers for you know different film types. So, the most common chemical method is chemical vapor deposition where gas precursors enter a chamber and a high substrate temperature prompts a reaction to build the desired film. So, different types of CVDs are there one is called uh, low pressure CVD you have atmospheric pressure CVD, you have plasma enhanced CVD and atomic layer deposition. So, CVD requires low pressure and high substrate temperature that ensures that the reaction occurs only on the substrates surface and not in the gas phase uh, which could lead to particle formation and surface deposition. So, here is the uh, setup typically used for low pressure CVD. So, in this particular case of low pressure CVD, the reactor consists of a quartz tube that you see here. This is a quartz tube that is connected to a pump okay? and the gas inlet is used to introduce the reactant gases as well as the gases needs to purge the system. You typically, nitrogen is used for purging. And the wafers are loaded through the door which is on the left. So, you can open this uh, door and you can load this sample. Okay. In low pressure system, the wafers can be uh, placed closer as you can see here. A furnace, so this is a three zone furnace that is there from the three sides, okay, top, back and bottom. Okay. And uh, this particular one. Um, actually encompasses the quartz uh, tube and this heats up the chamber which drives the reaction rate faster. Now, what is the advantages of low pressure CVT? The first thing is it is a relatively simple design. So, excellent economy, it gives you high throughput and very good uniformity of the thin films. But there are some um, disadvantages also. So, you can say what are the disadvantages? They are susceptible to particle contamination. So, it uh, re requires frequent cleaning of this setup and also you need to compensate for gas depletion effects. Next method we will see is plasma enhanced CVD. Now, single wafer process chambers for uh, plasma CVD look somewhat similar to this uh, low power uh, CVD. Okay. Adjacent figure here, it shows a schematic that 
tells you how exactly you know single wafer plasma chamber will look like. So, as with the single wafer LPCVD chambers, here also the precursor gas is fed to the chamber using the shower head. Okay. So, you see here and that ensure the uniformity of the precursor concentration over the wafer phase. So, this is where the wafer is uh, capped and this is basically on a heated plate. Okay. So, the wafer sits on a heated plate and the byproduct gases are uh, exhausted through this uh, outlet which is below the wafer level. Okay. Now, with the direct exposure uh, RF uh, PECVD systems typically employ shower head as an electrode for the interaction of the RF energy to create the plasma that you see here. Okay. The precursor entering the plasma undergoes uh, electron molecule collisions producing high energy excited molecules and molecular fragments that absorb on the substrate surface and deposit the film. So, these are the um, gas inlets. Okay. So, the next method is atomic layer deposition. So, atomic layer deposition um, or ALD, it starts by a pulse okay, of uh, metal organic precursor gas into a deposition chamber as you can see here this is the first stage. Under certain conditions, the gas will react with the surface species of the substrate in a self-limiting reaction that is terminated when the surface runs out of the reactants. So, that is why it is called a uh, self uh, limiting reaction and the excess gas is pulsed um, in the next step with a neutral gas. So, as you can see here nitrogen is being used for doing the purging. You can also use uh, argon depending on the process requirements. So, the second reactant is then introduced into the chamber in the third stage. So, here the second one is introduced and again that starts reacting with the surface species like that and the excess reactant is again purged in the fourth step. So, that that gives you one particular cycle and then it is repeated. So, you can actually atomic layer deposition as the name tells you, you can actually deposit layer by layer of atoms and grow your thin film. So, in an ideal um, ALD process, one atomic layer of material is deposited in each cycle that is what it does. So, you can actually precisely control the thickness of the films using uh, this particular method. The number of cycles will then determine the overall thickness of the film. Okay. And ALD deposited films are highly conformal and they can be used for coating and encapsulating of complex geometries because you have complete control on you know the thickness of the films that are being deposited. Okay. So, with that we move on to the third method of uh, depositing thin films that is epitaxy. So, when we talk about epitaxy it basically this word comes from a Greek word which means ordered upon. So, epitaxy means basically the growth of a single crystal film on top of a crystalline substrate. So, for most of the thin film application which includes uh, soft or hard coating, protective coating, optical coating, it has little importance. However, when you go for um, semiconductor thin film technology, this becomes very, very crucial the crystalline growth becomes very very crucial. So, this is what we mean by crystalline growth. So, this is not epitaxial, but this is epitaxial. Okay. So, it is a crystalline growth ordered and a crystalline growth. Now, note that when we talk about the other thin films, you know, they, if they are not crystalline, they are typically amorphous. Okay. So, amorphous films are preferred over thin films due to their simpler production. Okay, used when their properties can meet the application requirement. So, if you are able to um, 
provide an amorphous film that can serve your purpose, you stick to that. You do not need to develop a crystalline film or a very ordered film because that makes it very expensive. Okay? Now, when we talk about the optical coatings where you know the refractive index control is crucial, you actually use amorphous films okay? that works for you. Metal films are commonly used in amorphous form for consistent electrical conductivity and optical refractivity. While amorphous materials, they lack distinct electronic band structure due to their randomness, crystals process defines band structure with their ordered arrangements. And crystallization can occur through annealing. Okay? But epitaxy is a more formal process for creating high quality crystalline films. So, here is an example of uh, method of epitaxy which is metal organic CBD. So, this is very very similar to um, LPCBD that you have seen. It grows thin layers by sending special gases over the substrate. Now, if you see the shower head here okay, in this particular figure, it is designed for equal distribution of gaseous precursors through the chamber onto the wafer. So, these are different gases which comes in. Okay? It allows a quick and uniform diffusion of gas molecules onto a rotating uh, heated wafer. So, this is the wafer which is being on a you know, rotating uh, platform and which is also heated. So, nitrogen gas is typically used for um, purging the system and uh, argon gas can be used as the carrier of the metal organic precursors. These are the wafer lo loading window, this is the exhaust okay? and this is where the resistance heater is that hits up the platform. Okay? So, you can actually see that you know this, this particular uh, wafer act rotates on this platform at a speed up to 1000 rpm. The film thickness which is grown epitaxially that means orderly okay, is mainly controlled by deposition time and the growth rate. And growth rate is also strongly affected by the growth pressure in the chamber, substrate temperature and the precursor flow rate. So, these are the factors they, they actually decide what will be the growth rate of the film. The other method is called molecular beam epitaxy. This is an epitaxy method where thin film uh, deposition of single crystals take place. So, in this particular method, it is widely used in manufacturing semiconductor devices, something like transistors, and it is considered as one of the fundamental tools for development of nanotechnology. So, MBE, molecular beam epitaxy, is used to fabricate diodes and, and MOSFETs. MOS means metal oxide semiconductor FETs, okay, working at microwave frequencies, okay, and to manufacture the lasers used to read optical discs such as CD and DVDs. So, I will go into the process soon. So, remember that MBE is considered to be one of the cleanest but also one of the most technically challenging and demanding process because this MBE growth takes place in ultra high vacuum environment. So, this, this is the chamber which is a ultra high vacuum UHV chamber. So, an experimental setup as you can see here, it consists of two or more Knudsen efficient effusion cells or you can say them as K cells which are located at the bottom of this uh, ultra high vacuum chamber and they are aligned towards the center of the chamber like this okay, where the sample holder with a substrate. So, this is the sample holder where the substrate is actually located. Now, each individual K cells they contain different elements in ultra pure solid form. So, when you say ultra pure, the purity is typically 99.999 percent. Okay? So, what kind of materials like selenium, bismuth, okay, they are used in the thin film synthesis. Now, how, how it works? The process of MBE growth starts by heating these K cells to appropriate temperature until the elements in each cell reach a sublimation point. Okay? And, uh, 
then the shutters over here as you can see this shutters this is open shutter open shutter and this is a closed shutter so these shutters are then open and the physical vapor from each k cell diffuses through the chamber until it reaches the substrate and get deposited and this is how thin films are being formed now remember that for more uniform growth um, substrate can be continuously rotated at low rotation speed so when i say low rotation speed it is typically 1 or 2 rpm okay um, by utilizing a stepper motor which can be attached to this uh, magnetic manipulator so this is how in this form it can be slowly rotated and the electrons which come from this reed gun okay so this is uh, electron diffraction gun so you can see that uh, it actually incident electron at a very low angle and you can get the deflected electron and you can observe the pattern here and this pattern can actually reveal the quality of the film that is being uh, developed and also you can uh, measure the film thickness uh, starting from single mono layer okay so as i told this uh, particular characterization is done by using reflection high energy electron diffraction that is r h e e d okay so in this particular method the final uh, composition of the film will depend on the temperature and the surface uh, atomic structure of the substrate as well as it will also uh, depend on the flux ratio of individual components which are reaching the substrate so this is how you can mix things up and get a uh, you know thin film of a particular composite material selective opening of the structures um, shutters of each um, k cell they will ensure growth uh, using only specific elements so you can also do one by one kind of you know just by opening the shutters you can do one layer first and then the next layer and so on and uh, you can characterize the thin film that is getting generated by this read method okay so this particular table sums up all the techniques that we have studied till now so you can see the methods are being mentioned here so evaporation sputtering pulsed laser deposition low power cvd plasma enhanced cvd ald mocvd and mbe and you can see the parameters on which they are discussed so you have substrate temperature uh, deposition energy pressure step coverage defect density uniformity um, deposition rate and the materials that are used and what are the different applications so this actually gives you a very good idea and what is important to see here that all these methods more or less are very very uniform other than uh, pulse laser deposition that does not give a very un good uniformity and you can see that uh, this is pulse laser deposition is also slow and these are first evaporation and sputtering are first deposition method these are physical methods in chemical methods lpcvd and pecvd are first methods okay and you can also see the substrate temperature in this case you can have a wide range in case of physical method in lpcvd it should be high pcvd it should be moderate and these are the materials that can be used so when you talk about mbe these are typically compound semiconductors like gallium arsenide indium phosphide and alum aluminum gallium arsenide mocvd you can again use the similar kind of uh, compound semiconductors atomic layer deposition is useful for alumina hopium oxide silicon dioxide and certain metals okay then silicon dioxide can be also de deposited by low pressure cvd or plasma enhanced cvd okay polysilicon can be done by pcvd okay pulsed laser deposition can do complex compounds as we mentioned though it is poor or slow but this method only allows to develop this kind of complex compounds like pzt ybco and other ferroelectric materials and so on so these are the different different applications so optical thin films as you can see evaporation and sputtering they are the most commonly used for uh, making thin films that can be used for um, photonics application okay 
then MOCVD they can manufacture optoelectronic devices and MB they are also in the useful for research and development in epitaxy and other optoelectronics components. So, this particular chart should actually give you a complete overview of the different processes in thin film growth and what are their pros and cons and what are their applications. So, with that um, I thank you for your attention and we will stop here and in the next lecture we will look into the methods of lithography and pattern transfer of how to make a particular pattern on your for your device and if you have got any queries regarding this lecture you can always drop an email to this email address mentioning MOOC on the subject line. Thank you.